Welcome to the Hero Maker Podcast. I'm Andrea Schreeman, writer, director, EP, living in LA. I'm Jennifer Morrison, and I currently serve as the Commissioner of Public Safety for the state of Vermont. We are here to seek out and tell the full story of our friends who were murdered in college, Rachel Raver and Warren Fulton III. We really need to make sure that their deaths were not in vain and that every possible lesson and improvement for the system can be squeezed from the retelling of the circumstances that ultimately led to the identification of their killer. Today we have someone who has been mentioned many, many times on the podcast by our guests, the Director of Victim Services in Fairfax County, Virginia, Sally Fayez is with us. Sally Fayez got more shouts out so far on this podcast than anyone. Yeah, it was wonderful to speak with her. You and I both were gushing. Tears were falling from our eyes while we listened to a lot of what Sally had to say. She was there. She was there for all three trials, uh, Rachel Marn's trials in, in Fairfax. She met the family members of our friends and uh, Tina Jefferson's family. She met the witnesses. And she, she's a great example of, how do I say this? Uh, Sally, Sally knows how to victim advocate. <laughs> she's like right. the top of the top. Right. Sally is clearly extremely passionate and skilled at what she does. And if anyone out there has any doubt about the important role that victim advocates play in these cases, they will have no doubt after this episode. She's really wonderful. And I'm looking forward to to folks getting a chance to hear about the depth and the breadth of the work they do to complement the investigative side of cases, the prosecution side of cases, that there's a whole nother layer there. And Who knows? Maybe out there in our listenership, there's a future victim advocate in the making. Yeah. All right. Here we go. This is Sally Fayez. Go sweet Sally. Hi, it's nice to kind of meet you all. Yeah, this counts. (laughs) This counts post-COVID. I know. I know. It works. So Jennifer, I, I met Sally. Sally, I think the first time we talked was about two years ago, right? Yeah, it was more than that because I was in, I believe I was in the old building when we talked because we moved to a new headquarters. So it was more than a few years ago, I think. Yeah. Was this yeah. during your research, Andrea? Yes, this, this was the early days. Sally was definitely yeah. one of the people I was able to locate and that Dee Dee told me about early on. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I have to say that you are like the number one most mentioned oh. person throughout this journey so far, many people, Dee Dee being one of them, and both the investigators and, and Lisa. Lisa, they all mentioned you and they were so glowing about you. We had to talk to you for sure. Thank you. I'm honored by that. You know, there's always a case that stays with you and I think molds who you are and who you become as an advocate. And it was definitely that case. So obviously all these years later, that still means a lot to me because they had the same impact on me even more, I think. That's a pretty strong statement that you just made. So this case for you is the one that molded you. So it happened early in your career. Is that accurate? It happened early in my career here in Fairfax. So I started my career in Pittsburgh after graduate school, and then I moved to Fairfax in 2004. And then this case came about the first time around was 2006. But it was the first of this magnitude other than, like, I wasn't here during the sniper trials, which was a whole different set of circumstances, but this was the first of its magnitude, like, that stayed in Fairfax. How did you get interested in the field of victim advocacy? I always tell the story. I was fallen told to get into the field of victim (laughs) services. So I went to the University of Pittsburgh for my master's in social work. And you have to do a year internship. And prior to that, all of my interest was working with juvenile offenders. Even the summer before I started graduate school, I had worked at a kind of like the last resort home for juvenile offenders before they have to go to juvenile detention. Did the scared straight program with them, all of that. And so when I went to graduate school, you have to do a year internship and you can kind of select what you want to do. And everything I wanted to do was with juvenile offenders, like the public defender's office, everything non-victim. So my field liaison at uh, the university said, you need to see how the other half lives. And so she actually 
Ballin told me that I was going to be doing my internship at the time it was called the Center for Victims of Violent Crime in Pittsburgh. And that's when I did my internship in 1999. And then they had me doing my internship in the juvenile court. So I worked with victims of juvenile crime and I had like a little attitude about it. I was like, well, I'll do this, but I'm just going to go back to doing what I was doing before. And I remember my supervisor there who I'm still friends with till this day. She said, you'll never go back going to continue to do this. And that was 1999. And then I graduated and they hired me on and I worked in their prevention education department. And then a year later, I became the supervisor over juvenile court. And so that's how I started. And then 2004, you went to Fairfax County. Yeah. My parents moved to the area from North Carolina. And so unfortunately you can do this work wherever there's crime. And so I just happened to move here. I actually resigned and gave them a month's notice to find somebody moved here and applied. I applied in Arlington County with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. And I applied with the Fairfax County Police. And so I got hired January 2004 is when I started because they have to do the background check. So January 24th of this year is my 19th year here with the department. Congratulations. Thank you. It went by. It doesn't seem like 19 years. Yeah, it goes fast. Especially when I'm only 21. It's crazy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> really, really weird. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I got started, which is an interesting story, right? Because everyone always thinks something had to have happened or there's something, there's there's a underlying reason why I do this, but it was just a calling, I think, that I didn't even know I was supposed to have. Other people decided that for me, but I'm grateful for it. I really am. What do you think are the characteristics, like your personal characteristics that your mentor saw in you that had her go? You, you're you going to do this. I really wouldn't call her my mentor. My field liaison didn't really know me, right, at the university. It was just basically, you're coming in here, you're getting your master's, you have to have a wide range of experience. And you're coming in here very focused on just working with this population. If you're truly interested in working with juvenile offenders, then why don't you see what their victims go through? And if you want to go back, you go back. Her name's Kathy Elliott, who was the supervisor of juvenile court in Pittsburgh with Allegheny County. And she was the one that said, without even knowing me, it was my interview with her. And when I started, she goes, you're, you're going to continue to do this. And then she was the one that actually promoted me to be the supervisor two years later of the same unit. And so what was it that she was looking at that she saw in you that you think that had her say that or and, and advance you so quickly? You know, at the time it was an internship, right? And, but I absorbed it like it was a job. I think a lot of it was just the work ethic I, I had from my parents where I really loved doing it. And it was, I was really lucky because it was like, I think it was a 36 hour a week internship. My classes were at night. So it was really a job. And I wasn't doing what some interns do sometimes where like cleaning the closet and organizing the storage. Like they were having me work hand in hand with victims and I was going to court with them. I would do home visit as an intern and I already had that basis because my undergrad was in social work. You know, you kind of can look at people when you meet them and kind of see like where their soul lies, where it comes to like the empathy piece of it. And they saw that in me, I think um, with that. And I've never even really asked her, but one day she did say, she's like, I always knew you were going to be where you are. She's like, I can't explain why, but I just always knew you were going to be where you are. So I think for me, there are people that saw where I was going to be before I even knew where I was going to be. And you always have to be grateful for people like that. Because sometimes we don't see in ourselves, right? Like what it is we can or we can't do. But like I said, for me, I mean, I've hired interns that started out as interns here, getting their master's, and they just became very impressive. There's such a difference with someone who embraces this as this might be my career choice or my resume builder versus I just need to get my hours. Very two different people. Definitely. Because it's work that demands a piece of your soul. I mean, oh, yeah. it, you can't just do it clinically. No. To do it well, you can't do it clinically. No. And when I hire people, like when we do interviews, to me, it's not just how you do in an interview. And it's not just what's on your resume. I have to ask those questions of, you know, is this a job or a career choice? Because that's different to me as well. Is this an eight to four? Or do you know that you're going to sometimes work past hours and and my unit knows my philosophy is if your victim's still here, your survivor's still in court, you're still in court. We don't go home. And that's something that I have to emphasize because it's important to see this as, and I say this all the time, you are meeting people at the worst time of their lives in general, right? Like some may have gone through something much worse, who knows, but in general, you're meeting people through the worst time of their lives and you're asking them to let you in their life. And that's how I look at Prieto. If I'm asking them to allow a stranger, me, into their life, I have to own that as something that I take pride in. And that's how I always go forward with any of my cases. And, you know, Prieta was a little bit different because of just how long everything was and everybody being from out of town. But 
you have to look at the job of victim services as your career and a passion. And there are people that have come and gone from my unit. Those that are still here, this is their passion. I know we're going to get deep into Prieto. Uh, mm-hmm. And there's a lot to say and the fact that it shaped you. And I, I can't wait to hear all about that. But I would love for you to just put some nuggets out there. You've been very successful in building a team, funding your team, which is huge. How do you build, maintain, and fund your work? Yeah, so when I started here in 2004, we were a centralized unit. And so we were all in the same building. We would call it the police annex building. And I really do think at the time it was more like it was hand holding, right? Like I think that's what we were stereotyped as. You're just going to court, you're holding someone's hand, and that's really what you do. And it was trying to teach people that's not all we do. And for me, it was more about not proving myself to people, but I always tell people, when, especially law enforcement, when you come into law enforcement and you're a non-sworn, which is what we are, we're like professional staff versus sworn staff, you know, and Jennifer can speak to this. It's, it's hard to crack that wall, right? Like you're coming in and who are you? You're not here to tell me how to do my job. And it's one of those things where you have to go in and go, although I know what I'm doing, I need to allow them to see that I know what I'm doing and I need for them to respect what I'm doing. And so how I was in 2004 is very different than how I am now, because I I think that I've gained that respect from people. And again, not everyone likes me here because I am vocal, but the word is advocate. And sometimes the word advocate has a bad connotation, right? Like some people don't like the word advocate because they seem to be the troublemakers or what have you. But for me, it was important to not shine because you, I don't think you do this job to shine, right? You do this job because it's the right job to do. And then other people see that and are taken aback by it. Like, look, I didn't know you could do that. And I didn't know you could do this. That to me is where the years have gone because where we were in 2004 is very, very different than where we are now. So 2004, I started, I became the director in 2011. And even the name, when I became the director, it was called the victim services section. And then fast forward a few years ago, we became a division. And I think over time, even that word gains a different type of respect, right? And I think the respect in victim services trickles from the top down. We have a new police chief that started almost two years ago. July will be like two years. And his dedication to victims is very apparent. He has me at the table. And so I think for people in the department to see that your chief respects what you do, it matters versus if your chief isn't talking about victims or talking about victim services, nobody else is going to, they're not going to see the importance like the worker bees do, right? Like the boots on the ground, the detectives, the officers, they see it. But to me, it's important for command to see it as well. And the chief sees that. And so the meetings that he has me attend, the fact that he sees me as a subject matter expert is important because other people see me as that. Yeah, that's great for the respect. And I really get that you can get a lot more accomplished and that people will look at you immediately and you're accepted and you can, it just cuts out all that primate politics. But I've been fighting. I've been fighting. I mean, it's a fight. It's still a fight. Certain things are just a fight because they think that, you know, you try to teach people like what I'm fighting for doesn't affect me, right? Like I can go home at night. And if a victim wasn't treated the way I feel that they should have been treated, whether through the department or outside the department, I still go home, right? But Again, you can't dedicate yourself to this career and to this career choice if you're not willing to put yourself out there and fight for what's right, because we're fighting for people that don't have a voice. We're fighting for people that didn't ask. I always tell people, the only people in that courtroom that didn't ask to be there is a victim and their family. Every single person made the decision to be there. We're all either being paid to be there or the defendant made the choice to do what he or she did. And so why are we forgetting the most important person in that courtroom, which is the victim? Because none of us would be in there if there wasn't a victim. And people tend to forget that part. And the victims are usually the ones that are forgotten at the end, right? Um, Even the words that we use for victims sometimes of, you know, victims aren't cooperating. That's just not like, that's not the word to use for certain cases. Not cooperating is very different than the victim's scared. You know, it's trying to teach people that kind of terminology here. And we do trainings. We talk about words matter. It's really important how our media relations treats our victims when we're posting and putting out PAB releases, like our media releases, like our victims should be the first to know what's in that release. They shouldn't see it on social media or in the paper without the department who's releasing it being able to tell them this is what's going to be in it. Those are the things that people don't think about. Did you have to learn stuff like that the hard way? Like in the beginning, were there things that flew by and you were like, oh, and they were, they got upset and all that kind of thing or. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and it was a fight. I mean, there are certain people in command that I would, I would 
an email and say, hey, can we meet so we can talk about why it's really important that we know what's going on? And the answer was like, well, the detective can tell them. And you're like, okay, how do I answer this? Okay, so the detective's on, like, is investigating. The detective doesn't have time to call them. That's our job to do. I try to explain to people the success of where we are today was nowhere near where we were when I took over in 2011. I mean, it's it's a far cry from where we were. And it really has been a fight. And when people say blood, sweat, and tears, I've gone home crying out of frustration of what's happened here. I, I've, I've gone home angry. I've, I've been angry in my office because sometimes, again, when you're in a world of law enforcement, you know, everyone has a role to play. And the victim piece is a very small role in a police department, right? And so you basically have 14 people in this department doing the work and having to teach people what it is, whether it's domestic violence and explaining the power control wheel and explaining why a victim may go back to their abuser, having to explain that, explaining why it's important when we're in court that you let me know when the medical examiner is going to go up and testify. It's not because I'm trying to watch the trial. It's because I need to watch my victims watch the trial. And I need to prepare them for some bad testimony. So things that people don't think about that we think about when we do this job, but it definitely has been trial and error. I've made mistakes. I remember the first time I did death notification, I was awful, right? It was a terrible death notification. And I still think about that because we're scared when we go in there. And when I started out, we had no training. So when I first came here, it was... How are you doing? Here's a person that you can shadow. But I had a case two days later. And so for me, when we bring people in, when I became director, there's a mandatory three-month training for new hires because I need you to know not only how the system works, but trickling down to crime categories and, and hearing how you call and talk to victims and watching you go to court. I'm not trying to set anybody up for failure because the work we do is too important to just stick you out there and tell you to trial and error it. And that's what we had. You know, we had trial and error. Go out to a homicide your first time and figure it out. Or now I send two people out on a homicide and I have the new people shadow people first. So they're acclimated into it. But to just be thrown out in there in any field makes no sense to me. You're setting them up for failure. Jen, have you... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I would love to hear you get into this. <laughs> no, I just wanted... You, you mentioned as you were talking about when you came on board that you were all in a building called an annex. Mm -hmm. I was anticipating that you were going to say that you're now dispersed at the different, do you have substations or different places or are you all still housed together? So when I first started, we were all in the police annex building, which was actually like the first police headquarters in like the twenties or thirties, who knows when it was a very old, old building. <laughs> and I started in January, 2004, October 2004, they did a pilot program where they were going to decentralize victim services. So there's eight district stations in the county. So they were moving us to the eight district stations. I was again voluntold that I was going to be part of the pilot program and I was going to be moved to the Franconia district. So I was part of the first three people that went out to the stations. And I remember going to the station and I, and we joke about this till today. And I remember going out there and again, this is 2004 and I was supposed to be back. It was called criminal investigation division, but I remember those detectives did not want me there. And it wasn't because it was me. They just didn't want victim services there. Who are you? You're going to come in here and tell us how to do our job, so on and so forth. Fast forward to when I became the director, I tried to move everybody back and I got pushed back. They're like, no, we need our advocate in the station. I was like, oh, how funny how times change. So in 2018, they built a new police headquarters. And so my office is now up here and I'm on the sixth floor with the Major Crimes Bureau because that's what I fall under. Victim Services is one of four divisions in the Major Crimes Bureau. So I still have advocates at each of the eight stations, but I now have a Spanish speaking unit up here that I have three people that are in the Spanish speaking unit. And then I have three other advocates that are up here that take major crimes cases. So we're, we're kind of a hybrid. We also in Vermont which is pretty unusual. We have two victim advocates embedded with our major crimes unit as well. Uh, and they cover the whole state because of course we're a medium sized city at, at the end of the day, the state of Vermont is, but those assets being with the major crime unit, you could not tear them away. There would be anarchy if we tried to pull our victim advocates out of the major <laughs> crime unit because they are, are so valuable and they do so much important supporting work that allows the detectives to do their work. Yeah. Yeah. And so the eight that I have, so basically how it works is you work all the cases from your station, but they're also on call. So they also take some major crimes cases. But what I do, I try the people that are up here, I try to offset 
and help out the busier stations with giving them assistance and taking some of their cases. And then the Spanish speaking unit will take major crimes cases across the board, no matter what station where it's a Spanish speaking a victim because or survivor. Because what I was seeing is we were just going through a, a huge period where a lot of our homicides were Spanish speaking survivors, a lot of our child sex cases. And while I wish I could have every language, I just saw a huge need, especially for a lot of people that are undocumented to trust law enforcement and to be able to speak the same language as, as, with somebody on your team. So that's been really successful. If I were to ask you to compare yourself to other police departments nationally, do you feel like you guys are top of the heap, well-resourced or... I don't know, but, you know, you talk to other departments and each and each department's going to be different. Their needs are going to be different. I can tell you we're very lucky in the fact that the director of our financial resource division understands what we do and the importance of it. And so we do have that county fund to help certain victims with certain needs. We are under two, we're actually under three grants. grants. Two of the grants give me emergency funding for victims. That was how I wrote the grant. So we have the availability through that. If we have, let's say we have somebody who domestic violence victim, um, the abuser got arrested, but they can't pay the rent that month because the abuser's arrested and that was the primary breadwinner. We have the availability to actually pay their rent. We have the availability to do like an Instacart delivery of groceries. Again, things that people don't think about. We have the money to be able to, you know, we had a a homicide a few months ago and two of the kids had blood on their clothing and we had to take them to a station. So my advocate on the way to the station got their sizes, bought them new clothes and got them McDonald's. Each of my advocates has a credit card that they get to use instead of relying on my credit card. And that's huge, right? Two in the morning. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to Walmart versus trying to call me and me trying to facilitate it. And we're able to put people in hotels. Every single one of uh, my advocates has a take-home car so they can get to court, get to call out, transport if necessary. We have an, you know, an Uber fund that we're able to do it. Like the financial piece is such a huge part of assisting victims, whether it's DVs, it doesn't matter what the case is. Sometimes we're able to do crime scene cleanup if there's no insurance things like that, that I think has been a huge help. And if we didn't have that money, I think that money helps us be at the peak of what we do because it allows us to do more than just the bare minimum for our victims. But that's you. I mean, you're the one who's writing those grants, right? Yeah, we have a grant coordinator upstairs. So I write it and then they submit it for me. You know, the Spanish speaking one was huge. You know, that's why you always get worried of where the Victims of Crime Act money is going to go because that's for a lot of it, even though it's a Virginia grant, it's through the vogue of funding. But yeah, I mean, it, the amount of money is huge. And it really was helpful during COVID because during COVID, they allowed us to get gift cards. And so we had like a little bodega grocery store like up here in the headquarters. And so our victims would come to headquarters, we'd have a grocery bag of stuff for them to do. We would take it downstairs and give it to them with a gift card because a lot of people weren't working during COVID. And there was so much domestic violence going on that we didn't know about right? So the ones that we did know about, we had to make sure that we were able to help them because, you know, especially with domestic violence, you go back to your abuser mainly because of financial support and you don't have that. And so if there's something that we can help and try to give you a month's rent to help you get on your feet or pay your utilities, that's huge. Well, Sally, you're clearly have been, you thought of everything, but what, what is the pain point right now that you're seeing even for yourself or maybe outside of your office somewhere else that you feel like really needs to be, if it could be addressed, it would make a world of difference for your work or victims. I don't think victims rights is where it needs to be. You know, I think you do all this front end stuff. And then once you get to the court hearing, it changes and it shifts, you know, we're called system-based advocates. So we're in the system. So a lot of times it's either the common with attorney's office or law enforcement versus community-based. And I don't know about other states. I mean, I've looked at other states, but like Virginia, there's more confidential allowance for community-based versus system-based. And so what I've learned is the The more work we do and the more respect we get in the community, the more people know who we are. And the more they know who we are, they see that we're actually an asset to our victims in court. So a lot of times they want us out of the courtroom. And so when you meet with your victims and say, I'm going to be with you the entire time, and then games are being played to not allow us in the courtroom, not because we have anything to add, right? Like my my folks don't take notes. We don't interview victims. Our job is to just be there for them. I'm not an investigator. My people aren't investigators, but there's been plenty of times, even when I did advocacy that they 
defense attorneys were able to keep me from being in the courtroom when a rape victim was testifying. And I was the only one there for that rape victim. So imagine being a rape victim and you're up on the stand testifying for a day and you're not allowed in the courtroom at it because it's a ploy. That's a tactic because they know that we have that relationship. So I think a legislation still needs to be worked on when it truly comes to victims' rights. Virginia has a victims' rights statute, but the reality is if the Commonwealth attorney or anybody violates the statute, there's no accountability. You don't get in trouble. So why is there a bill of rights for victims if you actually have no accountability if you don't follow it? So it's on paper, but I think it needs to be more concrete and it needs to be addressed deeper as far as what victims' rights are. When you mentioned that this was one of the cases that shaped you, I wonder if you could frame up for us how you became involved in Rachel and Warren's case. So I was just assigned the case. Detective Murphy, who you interviewed at the time, came to my director and said, we need this case assigned. And it's funny, she just, she assigned it to me. I'm like, okay, I don't know what I have. And I remember having a meeting with him and I went up to, at the time we were in the annex, so I went over to the Massey building, which is where the police headquarters was across the street. And I met with him and I met with Detective Malewski, who was his partner at the time. And they just presented this case to me and they were saying that we were going to be going to court. It's interesting because again, I've never had a case like that where All three families were from out of state, and not only were the families from out of state, but all of the witnesses were from out of state, and some were retired, and so it was just about figuring out logistics, and so the first part was really calling and introducing yourselves to all these people that have known Detective Murphy for a really long time, but didn't know who I was. And so at the time they were all calling me Julie, the cruise director, because it's really what I was doing. I was calling people and getting their flight information, getting their full name of their ID for their ticket, getting their address. And so we were just keeping a a database of everybody that was coming in. And then we had to work with the Commonwealth office to get the hotel. So that's really what I was doing at the beginning was just really prepping to bring everybody So this is Tina's family and Rachel's family and Warren's family. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Warren's family had moved out of the Mm -hmm. area. Yeah. And then all your, a lot of people who were testifying were out in California, I'm guessing. There was nobody local, but the detectives. (laughs) That was So just for our listeners, I want to make sure we're bringing them along with us, which is the crime has happened in 1988. Mm -hmm. You get hired in 2004. In that interval, other things have happened and Alfredo Prieto has been arrested on the Mm -hmm. West Coast. And you come in at the time when they're planning to extradite him to the East Coast. Is that the right timing? I want to make sure I have the order of play down. Yeah, that's when I got involved, knowing that we were bringing him here. He was already on death row in California. Correct. When I got involved. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, he was on death row in the mid nineties or. And that's how we got him because at the time um, governor Schwarzenegger allowed us to take him. And that's how he came back over here. Yeah. In my creative mind, I'm like, it was a sweetheart deal. The two governors (laughs) got together and said, I think they just, you can take our guy, but you better convict him. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the reality is, and I think that maybe Lisa spoke on that was we were going to execute him first. I mean, after going through all the appeals and everything, it was still before California, I think ever would. So what are your memories about the case and the coordination? It's like an orchestra almost that you had to coordinate to get all the right people there for the second trials in Virginia. You know, it's interesting because so much time has gone by that if you ask me that now, I'm like, oh, it's fine. I'm sure it was easy breezy, which I'm sure it wasn't at the time, right? But it seemed seamless. But I think it seemed seamless because it had never been done before. The first go around, there was somebody in my unit that was helping me as far as picking up people and being in court. And then the second and third time, it was just me. And my thing with the second and third time is how we treated them the first time was how we had to treat them the second and third time. So it was a lot of creativity. And that's why I said earlier, it set the precedence for how we do things now, because at the time there was no victim waiting room in the courthouse at all. And I say this, Everything that happened with that case and how we treated the families was a group effort. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just the detectives. It was a lot of the players in the criminal justice system in the courthouse that really helped. Like what are some of their titles or jobs? 
at the time there was someone kind of in charge of reserving the rooms in the courthouse. And I emailed her and I said, are there any rooms that I can have to kind of have a family waiting area? And she was so helpful. Like, yeah, you're going to be on the fifth floor. You're going to be in this courtroom. Let's see if we can have this room. And it was before they started renovating the courthouse. So they actually gave me like an old courtroom that was held for like little detention hearings. So there was like, there was still a judge's bench in there and we didn't have a lot of money back then. So I got permission to get snacks and drinks and things like that. I remember using my own money to buy stuff. Like I would bring donuts in and things like that. And it was important because here's what ended up happening once they got here. You know, I got a rental van. They did get me a rental van, the department, and I would go and I'd pick up family members and I had everyone scheduled. It was like they said, Julie, the cruise director, I had a flipboard. I had everything that was going on, went to the airport, picked them up, took them to the hotel. When I took them to the hotel, I had met Detective Murphy and Detective Malevsky at the hotel. And then we settled them in and spoke to them. And then you would go back to grab some more people. And then we grabbed a lot of the witnesses and we grabbed some of the retired detectives or detectives that were no longer there and the DNA experts and the fingerprint people. We were just bringing people in. And then once we knew we had all of them set, then we would pick them up in the morning and bring them to the courthouse, right? And then you had to worry about media and worry about trying to finagle that kind of stuff. You had to worry about the jury. When families are hearing all that for the first time in Fairfax, when we go to the cafeteria, the jurors and the and the witnesses and everybody's together. Even though they have the jurors sit separately, you're still in line together getting the food. So for the family members, I remember we would go downstairs and we'd get them their lunch and bring them upstairs. They never sat and ate downstairs. We never let them. And then there were times where we were able to bring them in lunch and things like that. It was important for them not to have to be with the jurors because they heard so much stuff. They needed to process it and have them processing it downstairs in a cafeteria with people watching them. That wasn't the way to do it. You're reminding me of a conversation that I had with Dee Dee offline that was about hearing things in court that she wasn't supposed to hear. Maybe you remember something about this. She told me that when she was in there, she heard the defense attorneys refer to her sister, like the raver vagina. I remember she told me about that and that she was so shocked and upset. And then there was this, she felt like there were some weird games being played about how she was interfacing or interacting with the defense team's people. Am I referencing anything that you remember? You know, I think we have to remember there's a difference between this being our job, right? So this is my job. So I know kind of what people are doing and not doing. And I told Didi this. There's already a a sense of a heightened alert when you're in the courtroom. You don't know who everybody is. And I remember like anybody would walk in to watch it. It was an open courtroom. And I remember everybody going, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? And I understood why they need to know that. Like who's in here? And some people were just coming in there just to listen because they may have had a break from their own case and they were coming in to listen to that. And I also think when you do this on the defense part of it, some don't do it on purpose some probably do. This defense team didn't do it on purpose. I think sometimes they're just so used to a certain rhetoric or a certain verbiage they use. They weren't thinking that may not be the right words to use with the family members in there, right? Like I remember there was an occasion where they had showed Rachel's jacket and they'd picked up the jacket. It was from evidence. And I'll never forget this. After they were introducing the jacket, like the defense attorney dropped it on the ground. And that really upset Mrs. Raper, as it should, because that was her daughter's jacket that they dropped on the ground. And do I think he did it to be malicious? Absolutely not. I just think they're in their own zone and they're not thinking. But I remember talking to that defense attorney later and telling him that I had that relationship with him and he felt awful. But for family members to have to watch that, that sticks with them, that stays with them. And my job at the time wasn't to defend him, right? I'm not defending him to the family. As years have gone by and I've kept in contact with Didi and everybody, we, we talk about it, right? It's different. Um, So anybody's perception of what's happening in court is their perception. And you have to respect that because I, it's not, it didn't happen to me while I did everything I could to hopefully make it better for them in the courtroom. This was their loved one. And so they're going to see how they felt with, with the jacket being dropped or referring to somebody in a certain way. And it's hard because the families are listening to everything. And I also remember opening arguments and it was a huge courtroom and everybody wanted to watch. Like everybody's always in for opening and they're in for closing. And this was also the first time where we lived in a world where like deputies weren't going to save seats for anybody. They're like, whoever sits there, sits there. But I remember the deputy was so helpful. And I said, can I reserve the first two rows for the family? Like they deserve to be in the first two rows, not the media, not attorneys that want to watch. 
And that was new to ask that of that magnitude of two rows. And I came in the day that it was starting after jury selection and he had put two reserves, like he reserved them. Um, and that seems like, okay, that makes sense. That's what you do. But that wasn't normal because I was in court before where I would ask that on other things like, no, the judge says, whoever sits here, sits here. Can you imagine your family, like they're going in there? And again, it goes back to what I said earlier. This trial wouldn't be happening if we didn't have Rachel, Tina and Warren. So why did the family have to sit in the back? And that to me was huge to allow that. So I have a compulsion to ask you about Veronica Raver. Will you just tell me about your interaction with her? I love, uh, she was a rock star. She, um, what were those shoes she always wore? Rocket fuels. She always wore these shoes and we always used to joke like what new pair of shoes. And she was so proud of the shoes she would come in. And that was just what she was known for. She was adamant that she was going to sit right behind the defense team. And that's what she did every day for every trial she attended. Everyone else sat on the other side, kind of behind the prosecution table. But every morning she'd come in and she sat right behind the defense table. She was like, he's going to know that I'm here. I mean, there are times where I'd sit next to her and there are times she was like, I'm fine. When really awful things were going to come up in testimony, I would sit next to her. But she was adamant about it. You know, and the courtrooms we were in the first time are different than the ones we were in the second time. First one was just this big open courtroom that there were no dividers between the pews. But she was spunky and uh, she had a huge impact on me because, you know, for any of them to be able to hear the testimony that they heard and sit in there and kind of watch the arrogance of him as he's sitting in there, but then be able to walk out and go have lunch and just kind of make jokes and laugh, right? I feel like that was part of my job too, to try to not make light of anything. You can't make light of this, but you also can't have them so stressed for a three-month trial without trying to find something, right? Something that can make us laugh, something that can make us smile. And that was my job. And I just, I took it seriously, but I think that losing her affected me too, because we always say like, again, this is a case, but when you spend that much time with anybody, you grow to love them. And I grew to love every single person that was on this case. How can you not? Because we spent really every day together <laughs> for three months, right? And that was the first case was the first trial was three months long. So the first trial was we had a guilty verdict because, you know, with the with death penalty cases, it's a trifurcated hearing. So you have the testimony piece of it, and then you have the death penalty piece of it, which they call at the time the mental retardation phase. I know it's not called that now. And then the third part is the actual sentencing piece if they do find that he scaled on the MR scale. So yeah, that one we had, and I'm going to get them wrong. One we had, they came in and the verdict was guilty, and then the juror came back and said he was forced into doing that and that was the mistrial and that was the mistrial the second time we came back was the full time so we did all three hearings and that was the full three months then we had to come back because the verdict form had changed and because the verdict form had changed the verdict stayed the same but we had to redo sentencing with a whole nother jury the third time wow so during the third trial while the verdict remained the same the new jury had to hear what they were sentencing him to so we had witnesses came in and they, some of them would just read the transcripts. That's what they had to do from the previous trial. So yeah, we did it three different times. Were you involved or how were you involved in the execution? So the execution, I coordinated with the Department of Corrections, which were, they were great. The family wanted to come. And so I was the one coordinating who was coming. Um, Both families? I mean. No. Well, Mrs. Jefferson wanted to come. And then the ravers wanted to come, obviously. So I coordinated that. And, you know, and it's funny, there's certain things I also remember just about human kindness during this whole thing. And it sounds weird to say, but the execution was one of them of how we got Mrs. Jefferson to the execution. Yes, please tell us this story. So she was coming from where she lives and I put her in a hotel that we paid for. And then at the time, Detective Flanagan, who was now cold case, it took over for Detective Murphy, but stayed on this case. And I coordinate with him and I said, he's like, how are you getting there? And I said, well, I'm going to pick up Mrs. Jefferson from the hotel and we're going to go. He goes, wait, he's like, hold on a second. So next thing I know, he sends this email out to Ray Morrow, who was the prosecutor, Casey Lingen, who was the other prosecutor, and a few of the other people that were going to come. And the agreement was Detective Flanagan went to our Criminal Justice Academy and got a van. And we all went and picked up Mrs. Jefferson from the hotel. And we all drove with her to wherever the execution was. And I remember we stopped to eat. And the only place to eat was Arby's. I can't tell you the last time I'd been to a 
an Arby's, but that was really, I mean, if you go to death row, it's in like Podunkville, right? Like it's not in like a city, but I remember doing that. Like we drove with her and they all drove with me and we drove her back and we dropped her off at the hotel. They didn't have to do that. Right. They could have all just gone on their own and allowed me to drive her, but he goes, no, we're all driving together. And that to me went beyond what you're supposed to do as a detective, not beyond what you're supposed to do. Cause I think you are supposed to do those kind of things, but beyond what people don't know, what people do beyond just their case. and a Well, conviction. I wonder too, if you being there for so long and having all this foresight, it just maybe starts to rub off on people. I don't know. I also think that we were very lucky on who was on this case, anywhere from detective Murphy to detective Flanagan to detective Farrell, who they all went out to California. It was just, it all worked, right? Like every single one of them cared. Every single one of them took this case as part of their own. The prosecutors we had on the case, if I had to pick a team, you know, and I even have a picture of everybody in my office after the last election and Ray had to leave the office, we all went to lunch together. And we even had Detective Ortiz, who was the Arlington County detective with Mrs. Jefferson. And I still have that picture because to me, that was when you think of a dream team, it was that team. It was prosecutors that cared, detectives that cared, retire. I mean, even Murph, Detective Murphy and Detective Malevsky came to the death penalty. Like we, we picked them up. Right. And um, and how many years later? I remember Tom Jackman telling me a story, too, about all these folks who were involved, you know, yourself and Murphy Mm -hmm. and maybe Morrow Mm -hmm. and who I haven't met yet. And just the unity and the the singularity of purpose. It just it it really had that like dream team feel. We became a a odd family. I mean, like even sometimes after a really hard day at court, we'd go out and we would have a drink, right? Like Ray's like, let's go have a drink and just kind of decompress this. And we would be out knowing the next day we'd have to come back in. But the family deserved every single person that was on their team. And I'm glad that they got what they did get because that is what they deserved and more. And that's what my thing was. I don't care how many times it came. The way we treated them the first time had to be the same way we treated them the third time. Not like, oh, they're used to this now. They can just sit in court on their own. No. How you treat them needs to be consistent. And I believe that's what we did. If you or someone you know is connected either personally or as the result of violent crime to Alfredo Prieto, a convicted rapist and killer who lived in and around San Bernardino, California, Arlington, Virginia, and Jamaica, Queens, New York, between the years of 1984 and 1990, We'd like to hear from you. Please email us at info at the hero maker podcast.com. The other thing you would ask me about court, even one of the deputies. So I don't make coffee like in a real coffee maker. I like the Keurig. I don't even know if Keurig was here back then, but one of our deputies every morning, because in the room that we had, we had a coffee maker. I brought in a coffee maker and all this stuff. But every morning I came in with the family and the coffee pot was already made. That wasn't his job, right? But he'd make a, a thing of coffee every morning for them. And then he'd come in after the lunch break and another pot of coffee. I never asked him to do it. He was making fun of me one day because they he would come in. And again, the deputies got to know the families. So they would come in and say good morning to them. And Mrs. Raver started hugging the deputies, you know, like they all knew them. And so the deputies became protective over them too, right? But he just heard people laughing at me that I made it, tried to make a pot of coffee and it was awful. And he just started making the coffee for me. But it's those little things that are huge. I'd love to just ask you, like, who are we missing? Just hearing you talk, it, I'm really f- sensing the fabric of all these people who came together and every single individual that you're talking about, including that scheduler, you know, who gave you the room, she was impacted by this event. Who do we need to talk to that we haven't talked to? So the judge's deputy, he's now retired. I do wonder what he all, he remembers this case, maybe him. And I'll, I'll give you his name later if if he wants to, I, because it was somebody on the outside kind of looking in, but became an insider. Right. And then he got them twice. So he got them the first go around and the second go around. So by the time we came to the second go around, he hugged them all and he knew them. The other thing I remember is after, I believe it was after the actual verdict and he did get the death penalty or maybe I believe that's what it was. It was, it was one of the two and I'm sorry, I don't remember, but I remember the jury asking to meet the family. And I remember them opening up. It might've been the first one. I think it was the first one because they were upset about the mistrial. 
And I remember again, we walked in and it was just a family that walked in along with the detectives, myself and the prosecutors, and they locked the door. The sheriff's locked the door so nobody else would come in. And then they brought the jury from the jury room to bring in and the jury hugged every family member because again, you're sitting in there for how many weeks and they're looking at everybody. Right. And I think they just wanted to say like, we're sorry about the mistrial that shouldn't have happened. And then I remember some of those same jurors came back to the next trial to support the family and sat in the courtroom. Wow. Yeah. So you just, there's just so much that I remember a scene. Um, yeah. There's like no end to the ripple effect. No. Of, we've talked about it on many of our previous episodes. It just keeps extending and extending. I mean, you're talking about the deputy who's doing court security and then becomes involved with these people. And he shows tremendous compassion beyond what anyone in the outside world would know. And a jury who's so moved that they take time out of their life to sit yeah. for, through parts of another trial. These cases, these big, horrific cases can have this incredible radiating impact on a community. Absolutely. We've spent so much time focusing on the families and, and what you did for the families. And it's really beautiful. We also had the witnesses there as well. I believe like his, some of Prieto's family members and his like former wives, was it two former wives who testified or just one, Alicia Hernandez? Like one. Mm-hmm. It's, do, do you want to say anything about the experience of being there for witnesses? I think there's different levels of witnesses, right? So like we had the fingerprint folks that came, I think, from New York. You can't predict how long a case is going to go and you tell them they're going to be needed on Monday, but it's now Thursday. And and I could tell they were getting frustrated. So I remember driving them to D.C. so they could look at the monuments. I think I drove two of them to the movie theater and waited for the movie to be done. Because, again, you had to keep your witnesses happy in order to make sure this case goes as needed. And so doing that seemed like the right thing to do, right? They just were done going to the hotel and, and not doing anything. And it was but the days before Uber, and they weren't going to run a car. So those are the things that, that we did as well, like to make sure that they were kind of taken care of. Did you go out to California? I did not go to California. But again, so much has happened, right? I feel like I went to California because I was being kept abreast of everything happening in California. No, You should come to um, California. Not right now because it's raining, but. (laughs) But that was the other thing about the kindness of humans of how they handled California, you know, and it was, California was Ray Morrow and Casey Lingen, who were the two prosecutors, Detective Murphy, and then Detective Flanagan, who became Detective Murphy's partner in cold case after Malefsky retired. And then Perez, Perez came. Perez didn't go to California. Um, it oh, was, he was there for the extradition. Correct. Okay. It was a detective, John Farrell, who speaks Spanish. He went to California. So they all went to California together. And, and remembering talking, it was never lost on any of them how painful it was going to be to talk to Lisa. And I remember Ray Morrow saying to us, he goes, if I'm asking Lisa to testify, I owe it to her to go to California to ask her. And I remember that. And he said, I'm going. And so they all went on a plane and they all went. Detective Farrell had made contact with Lisa. They had brought Detective Farrell for the Spanish piece. I think Detective Farrell decided to tell them when he got on the plane that she actually speaks English <laughs> but I guess, because he was invested. He was like, I wanted to be a part of this. It's important. I think the cultural piece of it was very important for Detective Farrell to go. And they were adamant. And if she didn't want to come, she didn't want to come. They weren't going to force it. Um, it didn't make or break our case in Virginia. It was more powerful adding to it. And then once she said that she would come to Virginia, that's when Detective Farrell connected her to me. And then that's when my relationship with her started because she she was nervous. And there was a point where she said she wasn't going to come. And I remember getting on the phone with her and Detective Farrell and explaining it. Like, we're not going to push her. And the Commonwealth said, they're going to defer to me on what it is I decide that's best for her. And they let me make that decision. Obviously, the road was bumpy, right? Because it's back and forth. Do I want to come to Virginia or do I not want? I mean, you're asking her to talk about a horrific event. How does that not open up trauma for anybody? But I can tell you that she was amazing. Every person in that courtroom was moved by what she said, obviously, except Prieto. She mentioned that Prieto didn't recognize her. That it took him a while to figure out who she was. Do you so remember I don't, that? I don't know only because when you're testifying, I'm not looking at, Pre- I, you know, Prado's looking that way and we're behind them. So I don't know if he did or not. 
you know, but Prieto was just smug the whole time. That's how he looked at every court hearing. That's how he, I mean, he, he was even, he was smug when he was executed. I mean, that's just, that's Prieto. There was no remorse in him. So I don't know what she saw when Prieto was looking at her or not. I can just tell you she's a strong, strong woman and coming out and doing what she did meant everything to the families. I and mean, it was important for them. And we couldn't let her meet them until after she testified. So we had her in a different room until it was her time. And then once she was done was when she got to meet the family members. And I think that was really important because sadly, and I think horrifically, you have somebody who survived what the others didn't. And I think for families, it's, is that what my child was going through? based on her testimony, right? When it happened to them. So it was a hard day for all of them. It was a hard day for everybody in there. And I think that was really difficult of, is that what they were going through? But we'll never know what they were going through. They didn't survive it and she did. So her going there was, was had a bigger impact than I think she'll ever know. Wow. You mentioned that he was smug. And then previously you said the arrogance of him sitting there. And I just didn't know if there was any more of a word picture that you wanted to draw. We've heard some other people describe. Yeah, him. give it to us. Let's hear your take on Prieto. He just was smug, you know? I mean, they brought him in. You know, he was a troublemaker in the jail. And he tried to be savvy. But, I mean, he's a, he was a, sadly a smart guy. Like, he, I remember them saying stories about when they would take him out to do appointments and things, all the deputies had their faces covered, but he knew them all by voices. He was methodical. But he didn't really make any movements in court. The only time was Ray Morrow. So Prieto got on the stand for one thing outside the presence of the jury, I believe. I can't remember if the jury was there or not. I think they were not there. They never heard him, I don't think. But Ray got feisty, right? Because it's like something I think Ray was waiting for a chance to like interview Prieto. And that was the only reaction I ever saw Prieto make in the three trials. Ray was getting to him. And with the execution, he was smug. I think it was anticlimactic for the family to see that because he just, there's no remorse in him whatsoever at all. And I think there's cold and there's just evil. And I'm sure I'll get a lot of flack for saying this. I just think he was a very evil person. He was a very evil person. You could just tell that. You're not the only person who has described him that way. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Wow. Sally, well, I don't, if with, you've been very generous with your time and I don't know how much of that description of what happened with the officers going to meet Lisa we're going to use because you're third party. You weren't there. I just think it's important because when I talk about things that I remember, um, I remember taking Mrs. Jefferson to death row and I remember meeting about talking to Lisa. And I remember that. Ray's like, I have to be there. I, I have to ask her to come. I can't be anybody else. Why did you know that it was okay for her to come? What was the deciding factor for you to say yes? Because I left it in her hands. I said, you can call me as often as you want. And she called me a lot. Like she probably called me every day for a while to say yes or no, or what about this? What about that? And at the end of the day, I said, look, we have your ticket you leave tomorrow, you can call me tomorrow morning and tell me you're not coming. And I remember saying, you can land in Dulles and tell me you're not coming. I, I'm not at any, at any stage of this, you can decide you're not coming. We can have you in the hotel and you can say, I'm not coming to the courtroom. And that's okay. And we allowed her that. We didn't say either you're coming and we're going to get you uh, the, if you come, then you have to testify. It's up until the last minute when you're outside the courtroom, if you don't want to go in, you don't have to go in. Got it. And I also think she was validated in coming and felt good about coming when she got to hug those family members. I think that was important for everybody. Yeah. In the beginning of her conversation with us, which people can hear in episode 12, she said she did it for Rachel's mom. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. You had mentioned somebody that we might want to talk to. You said Detective Farrell. And previously, uh -huh. I thought you said the, the judge's something there was somebody uh the deputy oh the one who made the coffee yeah that's interesting and then also i got from that little section with you that it would be very interesting to have a juror yeah and Dee, i think still keeps in touch with some of the jurors so we've we've had you for a long time and you're just a wealth of knowledge and experience but what do you want to make sure that we include and that our audience hears either about this event or about the work that you do What's the nugget that you want to make sure gets across that maybe we haven't covered yet? 
I think the most important thing for me outside of Prieto is when it comes to victim advocacy. And yes, this was a big case. It was a cold case, but it doesn't matter what kind of case it is. They didn't ask to have to walk into that courtroom. They didn't ask to have to meet us. And so I think it's important for any listener to know that the victim services piece of these cases is honestly, I believe the heart and soul of, of some of these cases, because while our detectives are in the hallway, not watching the courtroom, not watching the court hearing because they're subpoenaed witnesses, we're in that room, right? We're in that room and we're carrying that with them. And some people think victim services is about watching trial with the family. And we're not watching the trial, we're watching the family. And so when the medical examiner was getting up, we're telling them the medical examiner is coming, you're going to hear what happened to your loved one. You can either stay in the courtroom and put your head down. You can walk out and I'll walk out with you. Like it's giving them a voice in a courtroom that they usually don't have a voice in. And part of having a voice is keeping them updated and letting them know who's about to testify. And if your family walks out crying, we walk out with them, right? You don't sit there and continue to watch the trial. And I think there's such a stigma of victim services. The other day, somebody told me that one of the defense attorneys saw one of my advocates and kind of sarcastically said to her colleague, it must be nice to get paid $25 an hour to walk somebody into the courtroom. And that was snarky, right? But that's because I think, and I told my folks, they do that because they know you know your job and I think they feel threatened by it because you're important to this process. And the work that we do with these victims is something that's so unexplainable to just the average person to explain what we do. But For anyone that gets into this field, it truly is, it becomes your passion. I mean, like I said, I'm in my 20 something year total of doing this and I can't imagine doing anything else. I've met some of the most amazing people and I'm better for it. The the families that I met with Prieto, like I said, and I don't think they know this. And it wasn't even just the immediate family. There was aunts and uncles and friends that would come that knew them along the way that we, we know we got to know. And I just believe this case in and of itself made me a much better advocate. And so you always talk about my awards and talk about, and I got an award for Prieto. That was my first award in the department. Detective Murphy put me in for it. I am who I am. I have the unit that I have and I train the way I train. And it's all because of the Prieto case. Absolutely. Hands down. See, something good did come of Warren and Rachel's death. Absolutely. That was like my thought too, but it's like, so it hurts to say it, you know? It is. And it, I think with all things awful, something good comes from something, right? And that's how we have to, to look at these things because we can't bring them back. And like I said, the families don't know this, but the way I handle homicide cases in my unit, you know, we now have a victim waiting room that a judge agreed to just give us. It's just our room and it's dedicated to families. But the reason I fought for it was because the families deserve to have just their own room that they don't have to worry about anybody coming in um, with the coffee maker that I don't make <laughs> with, um, you know, with <laughs> snacks. I mean, with tissues, we have mints, we have chocolate, like magazines. They deserve to have a safe space. But the first time we ever had that in Fairfax was because of the Prieto trial. Even working after hours, when I tell people, if your family's coming in at the airport, you're picking them up. We're not cabbing them. We're not Ubering them. You're giving them that attention. And so we've worked till nine, 10 at night, picking up people from the airport. If they had a bad day in court and heard a horrible testimony, I'm not cabbing them back to the hotel. They need to have that support system with them. But I learned all of that from this trial. Amazing. It is amazing. And it makes me feel a little bit less sad that some of these interviews, that so much good has come of this, right? So much good. It, they, it has, you know, it's the stuff that nobody's really ever going to know until you do have these conversations. That's not the stuff that's talked about. And it's some of the stuff they don't even know. And I think that sometimes some of the good that came out of it were years later. You know, it, it didn't happen right then and there. And I remember even Ray Morrow's retirement, but three years ago, we had a big thing for him at the police association and Dee Dee and her aunt both wrote letters that, and they allowed me to read the letters to Ray. So how many years later? Right. Wow. And I was able to read that to everybody at the going away party, like words from people that actually were impacted by Ray. And that was huge. Ray, we're coming for you. We're coming for you, Ray. You hear me? <laughs> Ray knows this. Ray, yeah. Ray laughs. But Ray, I always told him that Ray was my work crush because I just adore him. He's such a um, he was humble and um, he's going to kill me for this. Probably, but I remember after. It might have been after Lisa testified, Ray was impacted, right? And Ray would come to me and say, is she okay? 
you know, some prosecutors are prosecuting the case of the, the victim, the witness is done. They go out in the hallway. It's like, well, it's the advocate's job to go make sure they're okay. Ray would come out and make sure people were okay. Every day after trial, every day after trial, Ray and Casey would come into the room and sit down with the family. They easily could just go back downstairs to their offices and brainstorm, right? But they came in every day to make sure they were okay after testimony. But you know, one of the things that Andrea and I spoke about when we were framing up this podcast was about wanting to show the humanity behind the badge, right? And what what you've been telling us throughout this whole episode is emblematic of that, that these are people not just in victim services, but on the others, you know, the guys carrying the guns, the ones doing the prosecution, who showed tremendous humanity and generosity of spirit to people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And because of that, I know what detectives should be, right? Because of that, I know what prosecutors should be. And so when I know that they're not that way, I'm like, but that's your decision not to be that way because I know what the best of the best was. And now you're ruined yes. for life because you've had <laughs> yes. the best. But I know that other people can be that. I know that I don't do cases anymore, but I can make sure I have a unit that understands why my expectation is so high of them because I did the work. And I do have high expectations because I just believe every single victim deserves to be treated with the respect and dignity that they deserve to have. Right. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> well done. Well done. Sally, it is, it has been a long time coming that you were on the podcast. My son asked me today, he said, how, how famous is this person that you've been interviewing? <laughs> Not I famous said, well, at all, sweet man. <laughs> Not famous I, at all. <laughs> I said, it's Sally. I said, she's hero maker famous. No. I, <laughs> She's been I, mentioned more times than any other person. Anyone else. I've been humbled by it. Like Mrs. Jefferson's interview when she mentioned me, it brought me to tears because you know what impact they had on you. But to hear that years later and the impact you had on them. Of course, that's going to mean something because the last thing you want is to ever leave a bad taste in anyone's mouth of how you treated them or how they felt they were treated. And they had a long time to process how it all went. And they easily could say, you know, now that I think about it and that's what's so important. And, you know, and I annoy my unit sometimes. They're like, well, it's different than when you were doing it and you have these expectations. I absolutely have them because one day, 15 years from now, you're going to want a Mrs. Jefferson to say about you what she said about me. That, to me, is the biggest compliment that I could have. The words of Dee Dee and Detective Murphy and Mrs. Jefferson and, and Lisa, right? For Lisa to go through everything she went through and remember that she met me, that's huge. So I'm humbled by it, for sure. Yep. We're delighted that you would Thanks be a guest. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, it was our pleasure. And it was nice meeting you Thank you, you for you the both. work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for what you two are doing. I know it's hard to, to hear all this, but um, I think it's huge. And so thank you. Yeah, thanks for being yeah, here, Sally Fayez. Fayez, yes. Fayez. Fayez. <laughs> Sally right. Fayez. All right, you all have a good evening. Thanks to sound mixer and podcast producer, Michael Doherty. Sound designer, Andy Bill of Submachine Audio. And graphic designer, Junglin Bay. Thanks also to me, Hero Maker Director and Producer Andrea Schrieden. Please subscribe to the show where you listen to podcasts and take a moment to rate us. It really helps the podcast grow. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Hero Maker Pod. Want to collaborate or suggest a guest? Please email us at media at theheromakerpodcast.com. The Hero Maker Podcast is a production of Prudent Pictures. Thank you so much for listening. The Williamson County Cultural Arts Commission of Franklin, Tennessee wishes to thank our men and women in blue who help us deliver safe and fun family and community cultural events year-round, including one of the only authentic bluegrass festivals in the country. Bluegrass Along the Harvest takes place every July and at the Williamson County Fair in August and at the annual Tennessee International Independent Film Festival. Check out our full calendar of events at wccac-tn.org.